today we have a special guest speaker and uh, uh, Mike Ivy, and he's got his beautiful wife Jill with him. Jill, would you stand so everybody can see who you are? Uh, this is Jill Ivy. Give her a hand for putting up with Mike. And uh, they came all the way from Pennsylvania. <clears throat> you thought I was going to say South Korea, didn't you? Yeah, well, that's where they've been for 30 plus years. Uh, they have a wonderful ministry over there. We were, uh, Sherry and I were fortunate enough to be over there, was it two? Almost, yeah, March of 16, almost two years ago, uh, we were we were over there, and uh, they have a, a beautiful ministry going on. He's going to share some of that with you and uh, and share the Word of God with you. So if you would, uh, Mike, come on up and uh, give Mike a hand as he comes up. Thank you, Pastor. Well, good morning. It is a privilege to be able to visit with Connecting Point Church today. And, uh, we actually met Pastor John and Sherry roughly 17 years ago, but neither one of us remember it. Uh, we just happened to be at the same place at the same time, and we know that, but uh, we don't really. He said, well, that shows what kind of impact you make. Uh, but he invited us to come back. But let me say this. They're coming to Korea in March of 2016. Uh, what that was was an international meeting that the Korean churches were hosting for like-minded churches and, and pastors and missionaries to come to Korea for a week. And they were a part of that. Uh, there was a relatively large delegation of American pastors and wives who came over. Uh, and so I'm saying all that to say thank you for releasing them to come and to be a part of that. And they were a blessing and we got reacquainted at that time, got to spend a little bit of time with them. And uh, that was such a blessing to the Korean churches and pastors to see people coming from all over the world. But you know what was most exciting to me, being a part of that meeting and seeing it, uh, of course I saw the backside, all the work that had gone on for two years, all the decisions that had to be made, all the money that was spent, all of those things. But to be in a room of roughly 5,000 people, 4,500 people from all around the world, and to see a Cambodian pastor. He's never been in a room with more than 25 or 30 Christians. Ever. And a Cambodian pastor to look around and see 4,500 people just like him. And that happened with uh, a group of Cambodian pastors. It happened with a group of Vietnamese pastors. It happened with a group of Mongolian pastors. And they said, we didn't know we were a part of something that God was doing around the world. And that was exciting and encouraging. And that's really what we're about. We serve in South Korea. We have some uh, work and team members who work in the north. Uh, We've been involved in training uh, Koreans to go as missionaries to many parts of the world, primarily in Asia. We are looking forward to returning to Korea in roughly two weeks on the 15th of February, going back, going to a whole new location within the country of Korea with a focus on reaching internationals. People from all over Asia are coming to this particular area and we're going to see churches started to reach these internationals coming from multiple countries. They do go back home. We want them to go back home with Jesus and to be trained with the Word of God. So we're going to show you a video that takes 30 years of ministry and condenses it into five minutes. Uh, we talk really, really fast. So you have to have your ears on and pay attention because it moves pretty quick. But that will give you an overview and an understanding of the ministry God's allowed us to have and the ministry God is calling us to. So let's watch the video. Well, that gives you an idea of what God's allowed us to be a part of and also a little bit of the hope and the vision that's in our hearts as we return to Korea, uh, specifically for church planting there on that island. It's a million people. Uh, uh, several thousand uh, internationals are coming there every single week. I saw a, an article out of Australia just last week. The world's... Uh, most frequented, uh, most frequented two city uh, airline transportation between two cities. The highest in the world is between Seoul and the city of Jeju on that island. 
more more routes from those two cities to each other than any other two cities in the world. That's how many internationals, as well as Koreans, but internationals are coming to the island from all of these different countries. So pray with us. As you pray and you remember to pray for us, I would encourage you to pick up a prayer card. I didn't mention it earlier. Uh, you may see them on the back table. Jill will have them. I will have them. Please pick one of these up as a reminder to pray for us. Pray specifically as we move forward in trying to start the churches, we're getting relocated, returning in February, re relocating our home to the island. Uh, that will take a couple of months. And then, Lord willing, we will be having meetings in September uh, to be reaching people, having people come together in congregations. And we're, we're seriously praying about starting two congregations at the same time, two different cities on the island. So pray with us about that, that God would uh, raise that up and uh, see that come to fruition. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles this morning to a very familiar book, uh, especially for you folks. I heard your pastor has spent three years in the book of Romans and still is not done. Um, speed reading was not his uh, specialty, was it? Uh, but in the book of Romans this morning, if you would look at a very familiar passage, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. You're going to know these verses. You may have these verses memorized. Romans chapter 10, we'll be looking at verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach? except they be sent. Verse 13 is an interesting verse. It's very simple. It's very plain. A child can understand this message. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever. That means anyone. Anyone of any age, anyone of any gender, anyone of any nationality, anyone that will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can receive this great gift of salvation from God through His Son, Jesus Christ, by simply calling upon Him. It's straightforward. It's to the point. We get it. But there's something I want you to notice. It's not automatic. It's not automatic. We live in Asia. We've been in Asia for 30 years. South Korea is a very uh, fruitful country for Christianity, for the preaching of the gospel. People have been free in South Korea since the, the end of the Korean conflict in the 1950s, been able to preach the gospel freely. And yet we look just beyond the border into the north. They call themselves the most atheistic country in the world. We look over into China, and great things are happening in China, and the gospel is moving across China, yet the majority of Chinese have not heard the gospel. We, we look over into India, and yes, there's pockets of Christianity going in India, and yet the majority of the language groups have never had a gospel preacher in their language group. And there's hundreds of language groups in India. And the majority of the population, over a billion people in India, the majority have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. We look at Bangladesh, we look at Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim country. We go farther west and over into the Muslim section of Asia, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Pakistan. The majority of the people have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world's population today is just over seven and uh, it's approaching seven and a half billion people. We can't really fathom that kind of number. We can say it, but that to fathom that many bodies, that many faces, that many names is almost impossible for us. But out of seven and a half billion people, 
half or over half have never heard the gospel. They've never heard this simple message that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I would dare say that you could take a diameter or a radius from this church and go five miles out in a circle. You would find hundreds if not thousands of people within that circle that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the difference between the circle here in East Greenbush and the circle in Asia, here they have opportunity. They may not have heard. They may not have ever had a friend or a family member or a neighbor confront them with the truth that God loves them and he sent his son to die for them. But there's opportunity. There are Christians somewhere in their orbit. There are messages coming across the airwaves, whether it be internet or television or radio, that they hear the message or can hear the message. It's available to them. But those in Asia, it's not available. It's not there. It's not automatic. And we see here in these verses that God tells us, yes, it's simple, it's free, it's easy. It's, it's readily understood, this gospel message, this truth that Jesus came as the Son of God, lived the perfect, innocent life, and gave himself sacrificially for our salvation. That message is easily grasped, easily understood, but it's not automatic. And there are a couple of requirements that we must step into. Two requirements that God places in front of us. Verse 14. How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? God, first of all, with this simple gospel message, he requires a commitment to go and tell. He requires that his people are willing to stand up and make this commitment. I'm going to walk across the street. I'm going to pick up the phone and call my brother. I'm going to live my life in such a way that my co-workers, they're thirsty for what I have, the living water that I have, that they're thirsty for that, and I'm ready and available to tell them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He requires us to have that kind of commitment. It's a very old story that I'd like to tell you. This happened almost 60 years ago. There was a young woman, she was about 20 years old. Her name was Miss Lee. Now 60 years ago, this was the post-Korean War era in Korea. It was a broken country. It was a very poor country. They were struggling. And Miss Lee, as a young woman, she not only lived in this poor, broken, hardship country, but she lived in a part of the country that was considered the most backward, the most rural, the least developed. She was from a very poor family. And yet she had come to Christ. She had received the Lord Jesus Christ. She had accepted this very simple message. She had called upon the name of the Lord. And so within Miss Lee there was this burning desire, I want to do something for God. I want to make an impact for God. I want to be used of God. And she began to pray, but she was so discouraged. As, as a young woman with no prospects, no money, no real education, what could she do for God? And yet that burned within her heart. She began to pray, and she began to ask God to use her. One day, her family instructed her to take the cow from their farm and to walk it 10 miles to market and to sell the cow. 
And so she starts in this very rural area down this very narrow pathway. She begins to lead the cow. And as she's walking those long 10 miles, she's praying to God, God, I don't have any hope. I don't have any direction. I don't have any real opportunity. But God, would you use me somehow? About halfway to the market, she sees this little boy. He's about 10 years old. His name is Namju. And Miss Lee knew Namju. They had grown up in this area together, in these villages together. And Namju, he was from a family that was so poor, his father, during the Korean War, had actually put him and his siblings in an orphanage because they couldn't care for them. He couldn't feed them. And so now 10 years old, she sees Namju on the path. And as he's, she's walking to market with her cow, Namju is leading three goats. And he's taking the goats to market as well. So they have several, a couple of hours together walking these animals to market. And Miss Lee saw this opportunity. And she began to talk to Namju and to tell him this simple message that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord can be saved. She told him about Jesus, God's son. She told him about his righteous life. She told him about his death. She told him about his resurrection. She told him about her salvation and how he could do that too. Just simply call upon the name of the Lord. And young, 10-year-old, backward, uneducated, poor Namju called on the name of the Lord. That was 60 years, almost 60 years ago. Five years ago, Pastor Kim Namju retired from pastoring the largest independent Christian Baptist church in the city of Taejeon. He had led thousands to Christ. He had seen many come up, come up under his ministry and go out into missions. One of the greatest missionaries I know in Indonesia came up under his ministry. Kim Namju retired to become the president of the seminary where he would continue to train men and women with the gospel. And during that meeting, he was our seminary president representing our seminary. All because one young girl took seriously a commitment to be ready to go and to tell. That's what God requires of us. That's what God requires of you. To be willing to walk across the street. To be willing to make the phone call or send the email or the text message. You say, you don't understand what they've done to me. You don't understand how hard that is. You don't understand how broken this relationship is. Well, you are the believer. You are the one saved by God's grace. Take the commitment to forgive and to reach out and to love them in the name of Jesus. They're waiting on you to take serious this commitment to go and tell. We do have work. It's a business. It's not a church. There is a business in North Korea. And God's opened some miraculous doors over the past few years. In a nutshell, this little business currently has 10 employees. And our man on the ground is an American missionary just like me. We don't call him that. But he and his wife are there and they're able to spend time with these 10 employees and to eat with them and to love on them and on a daily basis interact with them. And that's really their, their little group that they're trying to evangelize and to work with. And people sometimes ask, how do, you do, how, how do you do evangelism in North Korea? You can't give Bibles. <laughs> Bless God, you have Bibles to give. You can't do that. Can't gather like this. You can't pass out tracts. It will not happen. If you do, it won't go anywhere. Two years ago, uh, an American, 70 years old, was released from a North Korean prison. His crime, on a traveling visit, he was there 10 days with a tour group. His crime, as a uh, Christian believer, as a deacon in his church, he had a heart to share the word of God. So he took a Korean English Bible, Korean on one side, English on the other, and he so desperately wanted to hand it off, he so desperately wanted to give it, 
he had no one to give it to. No one to receive it. So as he left his hotel room in the city of Pyongyang to go to the airport, he simply left the Bible laying on the desk in the empty hotel room. Sitting in his seat on the plane, seatbelt buckled, ready to leave Pyongyang, the police come on the plane, arrest him, take him off the plane, put him in prison for eight months for simply leaving God's word laying on a table. That's how difficult these situations are. So how do we witness in North Korea? He's the, the guy there. He's the one on the ground. God is using him and, and working through him in some amazing ways. And for a period of five years, the opportunity God had given him, now that this was not the business but he was in a pharmaceutical factory. And every day he was interacting with the pharmaceutical manager of this factory. And basically we were trying to do good works. Feeding some employees, uh, giving rice and food to their children, using the pharmaceutical factory to prepare uh, vitamins for schools and prepare medicines for schools and that type of good works wasn't able to just speak freely because everywhere in the factory there were microphones recording. Everywhere in the factory people had been trained from birth. You tell on others. So there's constantly people reporting on everything that Charlie does, everything that Charlie says. But there's one special characteristic about this factory. Now let me explain. This is the far northern section of North Korea. I've been watching the temperature there this last week. It was minus five, minus six was the average temperature. Now the special characteristic about the factory, even though we've got a quality uh, uh, control system in, we've got a quality lab in place, we've got good machinery in place now through the work of the last 10 years, there's no indoor plumbing. Now you think about minus six and making your way to an outhouse. But the thing about the outhouse, there's nobody hanging around to, to listen to what you're saying. There's no microphones recording. This, he wanted to know what hope had. He'd experienced over and over and over again examples of God's love and God's power. He started following to the outhouse. And over a period of several months, the gospel was clearly presented, clearly heard. So how, how do we witness in the north? Sometimes it's very private, very hard, very secretive. Somebody has to have a commitment to go and tell. There must be a commitment to, to make this happen. But then we also look at these verses. There's a second requirement. The first requirement for this simple message is to go and tell. But the second requirement, the, the question is asked, how shall they hear without a preacher at the end of verse 14? What if there's no one to go and tell? Verse 15, how shall they preach? How shall they tell? How shall they proclaim? Except they be sent. The second requirement is not only we be willing to go and tell, we must be willing to sacrifice and send. We must be willing to sacrifice and send. We've got to be willing as a church, as a body of believers. And, and I thank God you're involved financially. You've got missions programs and missions projects you give money to. Uh, I thank God for uh, the opportunity to be here and present our work. And that you'd be praying for us and considering should we support the Ivies in Korea, what God's doing there. But I'm talking about to sacrifice and sin. That as a godly mom and dad, as a godly mom and dad, 
When you get down on your knees and you pray for your kids, would you say, God, would you send my kid? Would you send my kid to the place they've never heard? Would you send my son? Would you send my daughter-in-law? Would you send my grandkids to a place that doesn't know the gospel? A willingness, a commitment to sacrifice and sin. That you take the very best of your church. You remember the story in Acts 13, the very first missionaries. It lists five different names of pastors there in the church, teachers there in the church. Five different men are named in Acts 13 as being the leaders, as the key, as the best in the city of Antioch. And the Holy Spirit moves in the church and the Holy Spirit says, I want... And who did he want? The first two names in the list. The senior pastor and the second pastor. He said, these two, the very best of the church, I want them. Your church, as a church, as a body of believers, we should have such a broken heart and such a commitment to sacrifice and sin, we'd be willing to send the very best of our young people. We'd be willing to send the very best of our young couples. We'd be willing to send the very best of our leadership. That we would say, God, let us sacrifice. Yes, we pray for others to give. We pray for others to sacrifice. But God, use us. A couple of years ago, some events transpired in our lives that were earth-shattering. And our youngest son suddenly found himself under house arrest. He had committed a crime. And we spent two years walking through the Korean judicial system. God taught us some amazing lessons through that period of time and through those events. The end of that as he finally received a sentence, our youngest son at the age of 17 spent six months in a Korean high school for boys. It was a detention center for boys. For six months he lived in a tiny little room with ten other Koreans, all there for various crimes. That was a very lonely time for him. It was an incredibly hard time for us as parents. The end of that six months, my son came out of that boy's high school understanding Korean better than I do. And speaking it well. Now, it was guttural Korean. I mean, it was, it was you understand, the language that was there, he, that he learned. And that's part of why he hears it better than I do, because I don't know those words. But God has worked in his life over the last couple of years and through that period of time. And he's now in his third year of Bible college. And I thank God for that. And I don't know what God has for him. But I've said this to him face to face, what I'm about to tell you. I've said, son, our man in the north, this bullheaded West Texas cowboy that's in the north, he's years old. He doesn't have a lot of years left to serve in the north. The only other person in my life that has a similar personality, that has a similar outlook, who, who jumps first and asks questions later, is my youngest son. And I've looked him straight in the eye and I said, son, I don't know what God has for you. I don't know what God wants for you, what direction he'll take you. But you at least, as your father, I'm begging you, at least pray. 
God, do you want me in North Korea? And that truly is, I don't say that to brag and I don't say that in any way other than to just say, we're humbly saying, God, use him and use the lessons in his life in the best way possible. But honestly, I know the hard personality that's required to live and to work in North Korea. He has it. And he has a language ability. And I've said to him, son, just pray. And I'm praying, God, would, would it be possible, would you call my son and use him in a way that I've never been able to be used? A commitment to go and tell. A commitment to sacrifice and sin. Another way that we see evangelism take place in the north. Sometimes it's that very secret kind of conversation. But sometimes God does some incredibly big things. One of the projects that God has allowed our team to be involved in, there's a great need for healthy nutrition in North Korea. And roughly six years ago, uh, a, a a group, start, a Korean group, started sending money and helping us and supporting this. That we now place a high-powered daily vitamin on the desk of every kindergartner in our county, and they get that every single day through a year. And that helps their nutrition. But it's a way for us to say we love you and we care about you, but. We first started this five years, six years ago, and the very first time that we were purchasing the chemicals specific to these vitamins, purchased them in China, we then trucked them across the border legally, above board, we trucked them into North Korea, and then to the factory where the vitamins are going to be made. We didn't know all the ins and outs of what was taking place. And... That very first order, we learned something. To make this daily vitamin, the key ingredient is B1. And in this very first order, to provide every child in the county a daily vitamin for a year, we had a one liter vial of B1, pure B1. One liter vial cost $15,000. Now, God had provided the funds. We were able to do this. So this first shipment is going across the border. A Chinese driver is trucking it in for us. He arrived into the city where the factory, the pharmaceutical factory is. It was past sunset. He couldn't make the delivery. So he simply drove to the hostel where he was staying. And we don't know why this happened. But God was at work. This $15,000 vial of B1 wasn't in the back of the truck with the rest of the chemicals. He, the driver, took it and just placed it in the cab of his truck. It was laying on the dash of the truck. Why that happened, we have no idea. So he goes to the hostel in North Korea. He parks his truck. During the night, a thief comes. He, the driver comes out the next morning. He realizes his uh, wallet and driver's license are missing. That's what he's so upset about. They call the local police. The local police come and they realize as they start checking, this is missing. So the local police call our man on the scene, Charlie. They said, we, this delivery is here, but something's missing. So he immediately comes. They say, this $15,000 item, this item is missing. And we don't know where it is. We don't know who stole it. Well, West Texas cowboy missionaries don't just have $15,000 laying around. The North Korean officials don't understand that. They think everybody's wealthy in America and everybody has all this money. So their attitude was, it's gone, forget it, just replace it. That's not his attitude. And he just starts going nuts. Matter of fact, this morning, this will give you an idea of the personality. This morning, Jill said, you know, Pastor John reminds me a lot of... <laughs> okay. 
So Char Charlie wasn't backing up. So this goes on for an hour or so, and they say, let, let it go, let it go. He, I'm not letting it go. They said, well, even if we get it back, it's destroyed. It's been opened. It's un unsealed, and, and you can't use it. He says, I'm not letting it go. Well, they called the mayor's office officials who are related to our work. They came from the mayor's office. The factory officials came. The factory manager came. The Ministry of Public Health, they're involved in this project. They sent a couple of officials. So people are gathering around and just not letting it go. And finally, God just gave him the grace. And I honestly, I'm not sure I have this kind of faith. I said, look, my God, my God knows where that is. And my God can help us find it. I'm not sure I have that kind of courage. I mean, they, they can put him in prison for that. But he puts it out there. They said, well, it's, it'll be ruined. It'll be destroyed. He says, my God is big enough to protect it. Well, when he starts saying this, they up the ante, the officials, the local police, they call in the secret police. The secret police, they call them the black police. <laughs> when they show up, people disappear forever. They think this American foreigner will back down. The secret police come. They're interviewing the whole situation. They're face to face with. Holds a. He says, "Look, my God's a big God. My God knows where it is. My God will protect it. It's your job to find it." They took the challenge, and so word had come around, well, we think this neighborhood, there's a guy down there, maybe a thief, we don't know. They go down, the black police go down, they just start kicking in doors. And pretty soon they find a woman who says, yes, my husband is a thief. Yes, my husband was out last night. Within an hour, the black police bring this thief. They find him. They bring this thief in without being too graphic. They, they put him in a small room and begin to question him harshly, physically. But they put him in the room right next to him with a paper-thin wall between them. Made him listen to every bit of that over the next two hours. The thief finally admits, yes, I have it. And he's, he's signing his death warrant. Yes, I have it. He leaves and he comes back and delivers one liter unopened, perfectly intact, and hands it to Charlie. And he took it in front of the black police, in front of the mayor's office personnel, in front of the Ministry of Public Health personnel, in front of the factory personnel. He holds it up and he says, my God is a big God. My God is a powerful God. And my God loves you so much. That's why we're doing this project is for you, for your children. Because we love you. And I'm not sure exactly how much of the gospel he was able to tell them, but he stood there in front of all of them and he says, miraculously, my God is a God that loves you. And I love you. And I would love to be able to show you and tell you how much. So sometimes it's in those secret places in the outhouse. And sometimes it's big and it's broad and it's in the bright sunlight. And God brings the glory to himself when he shows up. And that, that has happened. I could tell you three different stories, similar stories, to that very same kind of event. The simple message, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But there's some requirements, a requirement that we go and tell. There's a requirement that we sacrifice and sin.
going back roughly 60 years. There's a missionary who went with a family of five kids to that broken country of Korea. And God was allowing him in his very first year there to work with an established Korean church. He was going to language school, trying to raise his family, a lot of hardships, but he's working with a Korean church and a key part of Seoul. And one night in December of 1959, there was a tragic fire in the neighborhood right next to the church. And it was a wealthy family's home, but they lost everything. This fire decimated their home completely. And the amazing thing was the neighbors and friends, local, no one helped. No one responded immediately to their need of having lost everything, except for this one new missionary. He sent blankets, he took clothes, he gathered everything he could for this family that had just lost everything. About two weeks later, the mother of the family, she looked at her oldest son. He was in university. He had a tremendous language ability, spoke English well. He's about 20, 21 years old. And she said to him, I want you to go over to that American missionary, over to that church, and tell them thank you. He wanted nothing to do with Christianity. He wanted nothing to do with Americans. He wanted nothing to do with the church. But he did, in obedience to his mother. He made his way to that church. It was a Sunday afternoon. And he walked in just as they were starting their Sunday evening service. And this young man sat down in the back waiting for the service to finish so he could talk to the American. And that night, he heard, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And because that American and his family had been willing to go and tell, and because churches all across America had been willing to sacrifice and to send, that night, this young man named Daniel Kim accepted Christ. Just one year later, January 1961, that missionary and Daniel are going to another part of Seoul to start a church. And so they make their way over to the other part of Seoul and they begin witnessing to people, talking to people, inviting them to the opening service. They were running out of time. And January in Seoul is a lot like January in Albany. It's cold. They were running out of time. And so they came to this particular street, this particular neighborhood. The missionary said, Daniel, I'm going to go this direction. I'll talk to as many as I can this way to tell them about Jesus. You go that direction. You talk to everybody you can. Invite them to the services. Tell them about Jesus. And they departed, agreed to come back at a certain time. And so, in about two hours... The missionary comes back to the meeting place and there is Daniel, this young Korean man, doing something very unusual and very strange. He'd taken his shoes and his socks off and he was trying to warm up his obviously very cold feet. They were nearly frozen. It was really a dangerous situation with that cold. And he was doing something very unusual for a Korean. Koreans just do not go outside without shoes. They don't. And there was Daniel with his shoes and socks off. You know, we're a little... What would we say? We really don't like showing our feet. Uh, you know, there's, there's strange things on our feet. Uh, if, you, if you were close enough, now my wife knows this, I have male pattern baldness. The front of my shins are just bare. There's no, no hair there at all. Uh, you get ingrown toenails, you've got warts, you've got bunions. You know, we really don't like looking at our feet, do we? We get a little weird about our feet.
What does God say? You know something? I look at this verse. There's a very strange passage here. We didn't read it yet. Verse 15, the second half of that verse. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. God gets excited about feet. I don't understand that. I don't know why that picture, but that's what God said. He says, I like feet, and especially feet that go and tell, and feet that sacrifice and sin. And on that frigid, freezing, cold January day in 1961, the missionary came up and he said, Daniel, what on earth are you doing? And he's desperately trying to warm his feet up and trying to get his socks and his shoes back on. And he said, Daniel, what did you do? Daniel Kim looked up the hill and he said, missionary, See that house? The one that's three quarters of the way up that hill. I knew God wanted me to go to that house. And I tried. I tried to go. But the path was so icy. I couldn't get up the path. And the only way I could go tell them about Jesus was in my bare feet to get up that icy path to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. God gets excited about those who are willing to commit to go and tell. God gets excited about those who are willing to sacrifice and sin. But let me say this to you as well. God gets excited about those who will take this simple message and believe it and call upon the name of the Lord so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment I realize that most today in the room we've got our heads bowed no one's looking most in the room today you would claim to be a child of God and I'm talking to you who would say yes I, I'm a child of God I, I know I'm saved Perhaps as I've told you these stories and I've emphasized this simple scripture, perhaps the Spirit of God has nudged you in your heart today and he says, you know, I want you to go and tell your cousin. I want you to go and tell that co-worker. I want you to go and tell that classmate, that neighbor. Oh, it may cost you something. It cost Charlie a lot to be in the north. It cost Daniel Kim a great deal to go up that hill in his bare feet. It may very well cost you something. But you'd say today, you know, God is talking to me today. God's speaking to my heart. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass you. I won't come to you. I won't call your name if I know it. But you'd just say, but Mike... God's challenging me. There's someone in my life that I know I need to tell. And you just slide your hand up and put it back down. God bless you. God bless you all over the room. There's somebody God's speaking to me about I need to speak to and give them this simple message. Now perhaps you're here today and you've never called upon the name of the Lord. And perhaps before today, you've never heard how you could. But I've told you, in the last few minutes, Jesus, the Son of God, came and He died for you. And He rose from the dead so that your sins could be forgiven and you could be released from the bondage of your sin. And you're like that today. And you just say, Brother Mike, you know, that, that's me. I, I need today to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know that's me. I just need to call on Him. And you'd slide your hand up for just a moment and you'd say, Brother Mike, that's me. I won't embarrass you, I promise. But I want to pray for you. I want to call you to a place of prayer. 
We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world. 